Good evening, everyone. My name is Rachel Mosley Wood, and it is my great pleasure and delight to welcome you to the 16th Edward Ball Lecture. This is an annual event, uh, but of course, we were interrupted by COVID. We returned last year. I was on leave, so this is my first um, Edward Ball lecture post-COVID. And although the delights of the sabbatical are certainly very much with me still, I'm very, very happy to be here and to be able to welcome you in person, face to face, and it's really great to see everybody, um, but also to welcome you online as well. So thank you for coming and thank you for joining us online. So as I said, this is the 16th Edward Ball Lecture, the flagship event for the Department of Literatures in English. And for our guest speaker this year, we are extremely pleased to have Mr. Jeffrey Philp, poet, novelist, and playwright. And he's going to be speaking on the topic, Garveyism in the 21st Century Climate Change. Exciting. We look forward to it. Before we get to the lecture, however, just a few comments, and I promise to keep it brief. But we do want to let you know that, as you might have guessed, the Edward Ball Lecture is held in honor of Edward Ball, Professor Emeritus of English at UWI. Professor Ball has a distinguished record of service to the UWI, which includes three terms as head of Department of English, and terms as Dean and Vice Dean of the Faculty of Arts and General Studies, as well as holding leadership positions in the West Indian Association for Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies, and the Association for Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies. Professor Ball has adjudicated major literary competition, competitions, including the Commonwealth Writers' Prize. But of course, Professor Ball is best known as a writer himself and as a, criteri a literary critic. Indeed, one critic described his uh, piece, The West Indian Writer and His Quarrel with History, published in 1977, as, quote, a pioneering piece of critical surgery on a complex and omnipresent literary theme. Professor Baugh has also written It Was a Singing in 2008, published in 2008, Derek Walcott in 1978, A Tale for the Rainforest in 1988. I'm sorry, I have these out of chronological order but A Tale for the Rainforest in 1988, Black Sand, New and Collected Poems, 2013, Frank Collimore, A Biography, Chancellor, I Present, A Collection of Convocation Citations. Previous speakers in the Edward Ball Lecture Series include Trinidadian writer Earl Lovelace, internationally recognized professors Helen Tiffin, Diana Bryden, Carolyn Cooper, our own Carolyn Cooper, Glenn Griffith, and Evelyn O'Callaghan, as well as Rhonda Cobham Sander. So we're very pleased to welcome Jeffrey to the lecture this year, to deliver the lecture this year. And we are, of course, pleased to once again gather together to pay tribute to Professor Ball by holding this lecture, by having this event, and to pay tribute to Professor Ball, who for us in the department and those of us who have passed through the doors of the, depart the department, Professor Ball is really simply a former colleague, 
a much loved and well respected former colleague and lecturer and professor. So thank you for being here and thank you Professor Ball for your service to the department and to the university. I'm going to ask now Professor Sylvia Cohenberg, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education to give greetings. Thank you, Rochelle, and good evening, everyone. So I'm here to uh, represent the Faculty of Humanities and Education, but I'm also um, a lover of poetry and uh, literature, and it is uh, with great pleasure that we have this distinguished lecture, which is in honor of someone who is actually here. Uh, so many of our distinguished lectures are in honor of those who have long passed on and the best we can hope for is for a descendant uh, to grace the audience. Um, and just the, recently I was rereading some of Professor Bohr's uh, poetry for the somewhat painful task of selecting works from my poetry collection to donate to the upcoming um, the poetry event, um, uh, recite, where school children recite poems? Come on, somebody can help me. <laughs> Remind me of the name of the event. Talk the poem, thank you, talk the poem. Right, so, so it was my goal to make sure that I'd have a poetry book for every participating uh, student. So with pain in my heart, this one is going into the collection, uh, uh, hopefully for a good purpose. But I also reflected on the relationship between today's theme and the work of Professor Bo. Um, and when I um, read through his work, I realized how much of it exalts nature um, beautifully in ways that make us so aware of what we are about to lose to climate change. For instance, the poem Seasons from It Was the Singing speaks of the best time of the year, mild dry days, pellucid blue, the hillside still green from November rains, but then also tells us about irritable August or the waywardness of hurricanes. And seasons, of course, are what we are losing. And from the collection entitled A Tale from the Rainforest, a beautiful poem, um, in um, honor of the Lignum Vitae, uh, which speaks to the wood of life, salvation tree. I renew my faces of lilac blue and gold and always green. And then laments the fact that so many people born and grow and dead and never feel the rain breeze blowing cool across Sincona from Catherine's Peak at middle day. These are some of the things that we must think about when we think about the impact of climate change. Now, I noted a small change in the title because where the program says climate change, I, saw, I, I know I saw earlier climate justice. I think that's a significant change. So I really look forward um, to hearing um, what our speaker has to say about this. So on behalf of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, welcome to this annual event. Okay. <laughs> we usually have people coming out one after the other without introduction, but as I did not introduce, I thought that I would come back and say it. So we are going to now have the introduction of our guest speaker by Dr. Isis Samaj Hall, who is a lecturer in the Department of Literatures in English, and um, she will also continue to coordinate the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I guess before I start the introduction, I'll just say that for those who are on YouTube, please feel free to put any questions you have in the chat that come up during the course of the lecture, and we'll um, gladly check on those. And also, thank you to Professor Cohenberg for that startling reminder from uh, Professor Baugh's work. Indeed, we are in new seasons now and have certainly been experiencing a season of fires 
right, in ways that we don't think about the seasons here in Jamaica. So good evening. Good evening, all. As a scholar, writer, Jamaican, environmentalist, and Garvey enthusiast, I'm thrilled to be introducing Mr. Jeffrey Philp, our speaker for the 16th Edward Baugh Distinguished Lecture. He is a writer and poet and playwright who hails from Jamaica, resides in Florida, and has more than 30 years of experience as an educator. Mr. Philp has an impressive background, having served as an associate professor in the Department of English at Miami-Dade College for 27 years, and as a chairperson of the Developmental Education Department for 11 years. If you are here today, it is likely because you are familiar with Mr. Philp's work. Perhaps you encountered him when he was presenting a paper, a lecture, a reading, or workshop in the US, the Caribbean, or the UK. Perhaps you heard him speak at the Miami International Book Fair, or Calabash International Literary Festival, or a winter gathering of writers. Or perhaps it's because you have read Jeffrey Phillips' work in any of the numerous literary journals where his words have been published. Journals like Writer's Mosaic, Pre-Caribbean Writing, New Verse News, World Literature Today, The Caribbean Writer, and The Mississippi Review. And still, some of you may have gathered here today because you follow him on Twitter, where he's quite active, or you subscribe to his blog, where he publishes interviews, fiction, poetry, podcasts, and literary events from the Caribbean and South Florida. The point is, Mr. Jeffrey Philp sounds word power via many avenues, and he is well recognized for his efforts. He is the winner of a 2022 Silver Musgrave Medal from the Institute of Jamaica, the recipient of the Marcus Garvey Excellence Award for Education from the Consulate General of Miami, the winner of the Luminary Award for Literature from the Consulate General of Miami, and he is the winner of the Outstanding Writer Award from the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission, just to name a few. So I hope it's clear from the awards that Jeffrey Philp has earned. I hope it's clear that he is a talented writer, playwright, and poet, often placing the teachings of Marcus Garvey at the center of his works. He has written beautiful fiction and rich poetry, including Garvey's Ghost, Shango Music, Dubwise, Hurricane Center, and the very, very, very recent, March 16th, 2023, People Tree Press published poetry collection, Archipelagos. Indeed, Archipelagos may undergird Mr. Phillips' lecture tonight because, as the portable paradise poet Roger Robinson has noted, quote, Archipelagos is a book that gets under the diseased skin of history's oppressors and the disconcerting quiet fallout of disaster. It doesn't sound like fun, but the effect on the reader is incredibly liberating, putting them in an omniscient point of view that brings within them an understanding of the word, world's ebb and flow, history, damage, and healing." End quote. Jeffrey Phillips' dedication to promoting Caribbean literature, nurturing the next generation of readers, and supporting writers is evident in his extensive body of work and his involvement in various literary organizations and initiatives. I am, we are, delighted to have Mr. Jeffrey Philp with us today to share Garveyism in the 21st century, climate justice. Let's please offer him a warm round of applause. Greetings. Um, it is an honor to be here, uh, especially since Edward Boy is here. Um, you know, you're coming up as a young writer, a young poet. You know you want to write. And when people like Edward Boy recognizes you, acknowledges you, 
says, maybe you have something going. <laughs> you take it to heart, and certainly I did. I also want to thank Mervyn Morris, who is here, as another person who recognized my work early, early on. And my friend who I know is here with us in spirit, Dennis Scott, who taught me literature at Jamaica College and saw my first poems. Um, so I want to first thank those elders. I also want to thank Rupert Lewis, whose work I have followed. I have this both digitally and in print because sometimes, you know, my memory isn't what it used to be. And I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank my friends who are here, thank the people who have set this up, and the people who are going to make sure that this room is ready tomorrow morning. So thank you all for being here. When our ancestors were kidnapped from Africa and brought here, we lost more than just a language. We lost a way of thinking. And these, these ways of thinking are slowly coming back because of the research of many scholars. So I think we have lost something with Garveyism, and I think it is time to go back and look back a little at what Garveyism stood for and what Garveyism is. But before I go any further, I would just like us to take a few moments to acknowledge the sacrifices of our ancestors, both personally and collectively. Thank you. And as Burning Spear would say, make we do it. So, what, what is Garveyism? Garveyism is a, is a body of ideas and values that, got, that transformed into the organizational activities of Af of that Marcus Garvey set for Africans at home and abroad. And actually, you see uh, uh, th that graphic there, Respect Garvey. So you may be asking yourself, what does that mean? Well, here, here's the origin story of uh, how we came up, to, came up with it. Uh, back in 2013, we were fighting for the exoneration of Marcus Garvey. And we teamed up with the Roots Foundation, of which Michael Barnett is a, is a member. And we had stalwarts such as Jabulani, I Jabulani Tafari, uh, Priest Doggy, And uh, we delivered over 11,000 signatures to our representative in Florida, Frederica Wilson. And we presented those. You can see me cheesing it up there with uh, Dr. Ju <laughs> Dr. Julius Garvey. And, uh, how we came about the, the, the term uh, respect Garvey was the term respect was already in the vernacular. Um, and we wanted something to catch the, 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 the people's attention. And also what we wanted was to move them into action. And, and, and it was that part. But it, it, was not done, it was not done arbitrarily. I actually did a, did a word search of the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey and came up with the word, with, with, with the, the acronym, Respect Garvey. So this was, not, uh, this was by no means an uh, 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 arbitrary uh, decision. In the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey, he is laying down the, the, the foundations for what Garvey called it the, the, the African empire. He was 
he was involved with nation building. Garvey wanted to build a nation. He wasn't, you know, all of the things that he was doing was, were designed as a sort of government in exile. So whenever we, he landed in anywhere, let us say like Liberia or Sierra Leone, he would already have his ministers in place. So the first one, redemption. Garvey built the UNIACL on that primary foundation of redemption. And in, in, in redemption, what, you know, redemption means lifting, lifting up oneself and each other and redeeming ourselves. Uh, Steve Golding in a lecture uh, last month in Miami called it to restore the value of, right? Uh, so how do you restore the value of African people living in the, um, in the West? The next one is education. Uh, it could be said about Garvey. Cornel West said, uh, uh, pa to paraphrase Cornel West, uh, he didn't graduate from a university, but m many universities passed through him. Garvey was an avid reader and collected over, you know, over 50,000 books in his library. So education was at the core of Garvey's message of redemption. Self-reliance. Uh, Gar Garvey gave many, many, many speeches on, on being self-reliant, and this was one, this was another of the, the core values. Purpose. Uh, this was reflected in many of the activities that, that Garvey did with the UNIA, and indeed uh, was another foundational aspect of Garveyism. And of course, economics. You know, his whole purpose of, 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 of the UNIA was to make sure that there was an economic base to the, the UNIA, and again, and again, the nation that he was founding. Community, very, very essential. And of course, tradition. It's not behaving right now. OK, tradition. So um, many people said that Garveyism failed. But did it? Uh, I don't think so, because uh, Garvey actually put these, these principles into practice. And these principles, I was watching the Grow Nation event uh, with, with Ibo Cooper. These are what uh, I know Ibo would call the absolutes. Right? These are the absolutes that would um, protect us against what Ibo called the, 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 the cultural imperialism that is taking place right now with the devices that we hold in our hands, All right? So Garvey once said, if the Negro is not careful, he's going to drink all of the poisons of the West. And what does a culture do? A culture gives you barriers, it gives you guardrails, right? That you know, this is, what, this is how we do it, and this is not how we do it. But if you don't have guardrails, if you don't have principles to guide you, then anything goes. And we're seeing this happening. I was talking with some young, young men from Jamaica College, and they were talking about TikTok, you know? And I said, yeah, you can have, you can have a million likes, but what are you liked for? You know, it seems to be an endless, race to be popular, but merely to be popular and not to be popular for something, which is what many of them are missing out on. So Garvey started off with redemption, lifting up, he started off with just a handful of uh, followers and, and leaders. And I, I will say at this point, if it weren't for Amy, Amy Jakes Garvey, and, and uh, Amy Ashwood, Garvey would not be 
So you have to give thanks and praises for the women who really, really helped Garvey. They, they should be celebrated as much as he is. In some cases, because it was, it was really Amy Jakes who, <laughs> it was really Amy Jakes who put together the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey when he was in jail. You know, so you have to give thanks for, for, for what Amy Jakes also did. So redemption, it was there. This was what led to Garvey having, well, Garvey said he had 6,000, 6 million followers. Some critics doubt that figure because Garvey tended to be somewhat of a showman. You know, he learned that from Deuce Muhammad Ali. Uh, I will, I, I, will, I will believe Garvey. <laughs> I will believe Garvey. And he got six million followers, right? Without Facebook, without Twitter, without TikTok. Can you imagine the kind of following that Garvey would have today? If for his first one, all he, had to, all he would have to say is, always imagine yourself a perfect being. By the next day, he would have three million followers, right? Because Garvey was very much into the self-reliance, the self-help program, lifting up yourself, and so redeeming ourselves. Education. Garvey was always about teaching the next generation of followers, and in message to the people, uh, in founding the School of African Philosophy, Garvey made sure that the, the, the philosophies and the ideas that he was putting down would be a part of that and training the next generation. This was a book that changed Garvey's life. Uh, Garvey is like the Aretha Franklin of Pan-Africanism. Uh, once Garvey had an idea and Garvey spoke it, uh, it was done. This was one of the reasons why uh, I think Du Bois was very angry with Garvey, because Du Bois was there talking Pan-Africanism for a, you know, a million years, and here, com here comes Garvey, and Garvey just says it in his own way, and boom, everybody is following him. But the other part about Garvey is Garvey spoke from the heart. You know, I think, I think Du Bois loved us from his brain, you know, but Garvey, Garvey worked on the docks. You know, Garvey worked as a gopher for Deuce Muhammad Ali. So Garvey was there with the people. You know, he was not one of these urban intellectuals. Garvey loved us from the heart. And this book uh, changed his life. But not only uh, did he put, he put his ideas into practice and founded Jamaica's first modern political party, the People's political party. And as you can see, the, these are just some of the platforms. I'm still waiting for the opera house that he talked about, you know. But Gar Garvey had put his practices in, in, into, into action and not, not just, you know, some eerie fairy idea about where we should be going. The economics, you know, one whole block of the whole uh, uh, of Harlem, 135th Street. Garvey set up restaurants. I mean, I, I forget the name of the, the, the person who won the, the um, Nobel Prize for microloans. Garvey was giving out microloans in, you know, 1919, right? You came to Garvey with an idea, you know, I was, I was, a, I, I, I was a tailor back in Barbados, but now I can only work as a waiter. Garvey set you up, you know, and these businesses were thriving, were thriving, even after the Black Star Line failed. Well, I shouldn't say failed, right? Sabotaged. Community. Uh, events with Garvey were an all-day event, right? And Garvey set up, Garvey had something for everyone, for the children, for the women, for the men, and everyone in between. And you see the sign there, the new Negro has no fear. Because that was the idea that Garvey wanted to instill into us, right? That we are a community. Judith Sign in her, in her book says, uh, and I'll get to it in the next one, uh, 
when the UNIA in that first convention came up with the African flag, right? Judith Stein said, we are a coherent people. Before, we, this did not exist, right? This did not exist. But Garvey made sure that we, so again, to show you, right? The man is building a nation. Right? So that when they landed in Africa, they have everything. They have the flag, they have the army, they have the nurses, and the children are learning. Garvey is also a founding father of Jamaica, which, you know, whenever my wife and I go to the beach, we park either on McKinley or Taft, right? How many, how many roads and streets and bridges do we have named after Marcus Garvey? But you see, every day, right? American geniuses in marketing, every day, you know, they're going to remind you about who their founding fathers are. They have a George Washington, you know, everywhere. They even have a Ronald Reagan airport, right? So. We, you know, like Burning Spear said, no one remember old Marcus Garvey. But the man is a founding father, right? The first na named national hero of Jamaica. Yet no one remember old Marcus Garvey. Now, I know I'm selling the, the, the idea of, of Garvey as a, we, we respect Garvey, and it's a catchy slogan. But I would be doing Garvey wrong if I did not mention that he was a fervent anti-colonialist. And this is an idea I want you to remember. Right? Garvey, Garvey was against all of the colonial powers that indeed brought us here and put us in chains and brainwashed us. And, and the interesting thing is that Garvey aligned himself with, with, with the Irish movement, right? Many of his ideas came from the Irish movement. Uh, and they went through the same, you know, similar, I should not say, similar suffering with the rubbing of the language and, and, and traditions and everything else. Uh, so Garvey made sure that uh, he, he, he was anti-colonialist. And Rupert Lewis has a whole book on, on Garvey as an anti-colonialist. Pan-Africanist. Uh, uh, this graphic represents w w w how Garvey saw us as shipmates. So Pan-Africanism would be a, a joining of all the, the shipmates who came across from Africa. Uh, Sylvia Winter calls us the PSS. You know, uh, so Garvey would bring all of the lost pieces of Africa together. And when you think about it, we, we are the Africans, you know. We are the Africans because the people from Nigeria, their first commitment is Nigeria, right? I have in my blood people from Benin and Togo and Nigeria and Ghana and people way down in the south. Those people normally would never have come together, right? Because most people do not move out of their, out of their uh, neighborhoods more than 10 or 15 miles, right? So there's no way my ancestors would have gotten together. So we are the Africans, right? So this, this was one of the, the, the main messages of Garvey to bring together the African family. And indeed, he brought us together under the slogan of one God, one aim, one destiny. That Africans at home and abroad had a common destiny and history. There are, and I know many of you have seen an older film that talked about, you know, the, the <laughs> that Garvey somehow, how can I put this delicately? Uh, Garvey somehow wanted, was driven by the idea that he, he wanted to prove himself that he was as good as any white man. I think this is a fallacy. By, by the time Garvey turned 19, 
Garvey must have realized, as Professor Rupert Lewis says in his book, that he was a polymath, right? In other words, a genius. He, he knew he was smarter than most people, right? He knew that. Uh, think about it, at 19 to be a master printer on the linotype machine, which means you have mastered not only the English grammar, but also the intricacies of that linotype machine. And you cannot make a mistake. He was a master. You cannot make a mistake with the lino, lino, linotype. If you, if you leave out a comma, you lose your job. Right? So Garvey had mastered not only grammar, but, but the machine. Right? You know how many times I proofread this thing? And, and spell checked to make sure there were no mistakes? Garvey would have, I swear to you, Garvey would have done it one time. Done. Over. Right? So, Gar as far as I'm concerned, this was the driving force in Garvey's life. Garvey wanted justice. And this indeed is, is one of the ideas that we need to, to carry forward as we move into the lecture about climate justice. So we have to ask ourselves, what is climate justice? And climate justice essentially is, has been brought about by the, the, the practices of the, uh, of the empires, the colonial empires, the British, the, you know, the Dutch, the Spanish. Um, so, and it is we who are feeling the pain, right? The developed countries have, have done incredible harm and damage to this planet. And we are the ones who are suffering from this. So what is climate change? Uh, climate change has to do with the, the changing of the earth atmosphere, the changing of the land, the changing of, uh, 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 of the ecological systems on the entire globe, right? Uh, there are some people, however, who have confused the difference between weather and climate. I remember, <laughs> I remember someone in, in, in the House of Representatives getting up and holding a snowball in his hand and say, Oh, climate justice, ah, how come I'm holding a snowball, right? But that's weather, <laughs> right? That is wh weather, weather changes from day to day. Climate just, climate, when we talk about climate change, we're talking about things that can be measured not only in years, but also in decades and also in centuries, right? Uh, and as you can see, some scholars have traced it back to the start of the Industrial Revolution. And as you can see, we were, we, we, we were in you know, deficit there. But as you can see, the temperature has been rising steadily since the 20th century. And this, this is what is happening. Um, there are some other scholars and, I, I, and I'm leaning towards them, who, who do not say that we're in the Anthropocene, which is what we call climate change. They call it the Plantationocene, because they are theorizing that climate change actually happened or started with uh, the, the, the colonial powers moving into the, the Caribbean, and in, in fact, wiping out and they can trace this, wiping out the entire indigenous population. And, and, and they can, through, through carbon dating, you, you, you can see the dramatic drop in, 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 in the climate. So colonialism, again, rears its ugly head. Now, 97% of all scientists agree that climate change is real. Do you know how hard it is for 97% of, of scientists to agree on something? You want to start a civil war? Go into an English department and say, 
I disbelieve in the Oxford comma. You'd have more than five, you know. So for, for, for scholars and intellectuals, 97% to agree on something. Uh, that says something. Well, this is to show you the wickedness of Babylon, right? Even while the Exxon scientists were saying and predicting climate change, right? Their PR department was actually saying it is not real, right? And these guys have whole industries, you know, go, I'm not going to use Rastafari this time, dedicated, right, to protecting their shareholder interest and the profit margins. And so they spread disinformation for at least 30 years. They did the same thing with cigarettes, right? Cigarettes don't cause cancer, right? All of these big companies, right? But especially with the climate change uh, scientists, then you, in fact, the Pentagon right now is making changes that have to do with their bases in places that they think are vulnerable. So the oceans are trapping all of the excess energy that we are producing. And um, as you can see, the, the, the ocean temperatures are rising, and this is having a devastating effect on the, on the planet. But it's not a, climate change is not a faraway thing. Climate change is already here. And it's showing up. There are going to be other little ways that you can measure climate change. It's going to show, but, but generally, these are what we can expect we can expect more heat waves. We can also expect more floods. And by the way, all of these quotes here are from the Guardian uh, newspaper. So the floods are already here. They are happening around the globe. More wildfires, right, all around the globe. It is happening even as we speak. Crop failures. And I need you to remember this. Stick a pin in this one, because uh, we'll be coming back to it later. But the, the, especially in places like Peru, uh, the grains are, we're having climate refugees, right? Because the grains are not um, heat resistant. So we are going to be having more and more refugees even as the, 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 the temperatures rise. So with the climate change, uh, this just came out 10 days ago. The IPCC put out a report that said uh, the governments, the big governments, <laughs> need to start doing something now about climate change. But we know they are not going to do anything, right? Based on fast, past behaviors, we know that they're not going to do anything. So what, what does that mean for us? Well, first we have to identify how did we get here. Uh, I use this term, <laughs> we. As Sylvia Winter said, you know, the Maasai have not contributed to climate change, right? So, uh, but for the program's sake, we'll say we, right? How did we get here? Uh, this, was a, this was a book that really changed my uh, ideas and in fact was a sort of um, impetus be behind my, my new collection of poem, Archipelagos. And, and Amitav Gosh nails it right here. Uh, and I have to give thanks to um, Deborah, um, Diana McCauley, because I was following her on Twitter, and I'd been putting off reading the, the, the Nutmeg Curse. A uh, friend had mentioned it, I was like, oh, all right, oh, okay, I read it. Oh. And then when, when Diana posted it, I was like, okay, I have to read this book then, right? And, and it's a book if you're interested in the whole history of uh, 
how we came to be in this position, I would heartily recommend um, that book. But one of the things that he talks about, uh, the, the effects of colonialism, is um, the othering. Again, Sylvia Winter calls it negative othering, right? But this is the whole purpose of colonialism. You know, we and them, right? And how are we going to get out of this? And especially all of their philosophies, all of their philosophies have been geared towards creating a us and them, right? Um, and especially the, 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 the philosophies of, of Descartes, you know, which has resulted in all kinds of, quite frankly, alienation. You know, we've become alienated from ourselves. We've come, become alienated from each other. We've become alienated from the land itself, right? But what does Rastafari say, I and I, right? And remember, these, these systems of thought, like Rastafari, they don't just spring out of nothing, right? What has been, you know, what has been hidden from the wise and the prudent, revealed to the babe and the suckling, right? So, so these, these people within our nation have come up with ideas. Rastafari have come up with an idea of I and I to unite I and I and stop or at least abridge the alienation that we have, that we have experienced. So I see myself as a storyteller and this has indeed been one of the ways in which I, I have taken up Amitav Ghosh's uh, charge to us. And if there are any uh, storytellers within the audience or any storytellers online, um, this, is a, this is a great crisis that we're, that, that we're facing. So it, uh, climate change has been a, a result of our ways of thinking, our patterns of thinking. And if you change the pattern, you will change the result, right? It's, it, it, it's, it's just like a computer, you know, garbage in, garbage out. You put good things in, you get gar you know. So how can we change our patterns of thinking? But this is a, has been the result. Right? of our industrialization, over-industrializations. Right? Again, how we think, how we think about things. Uh, most native religions, most indigenous religions, have you try to live in harmony. Whatever you produce, you produce in harmony. Again, Rastafari has been trying to tell us this. Right? Live in harmony with the earth. But through industrialization, we have brought about the, all of this. The pollution, right? We're drowning in plastic, right? We're literally drowning in plastic, right? So the pollution, deforestation, whole, whole areas of the Amazon are being destroyed. resource extraction. And the resource extraction happens in places like uh, <laughs> that they've designated as sacrifice zones, right? Like the Red River here in Jamaica, right? And, and, and who, lives, who lives in the major sacrifice zones of the world, right? So what happened was uh, we are in fact facing what some scholars call the sixth extinction. Already uh, something like 80% of all mammals have disappeared, right? Right behind them are the bees. An interesting thing that is happening with the climate is that it's also changing, uh, changing just slightly in a matter of days or whatever. Um, the, 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 the pollination, of plants. So the plants open up, right? Plants open up, put out their flowers and everything, but it's still too cold. So the bees come out and they freeze. 
and then what happens? So we're losing pollinators, right? Um, and that is going, I remember we talked about the, uh, the, the, the crops like wheat and so on, the grain crops. If the bees aren't there, then we're, we're going to be running into a lot of trouble. Al Gore has called climate, climate change an existential threat, right? For mankind, right? But again, we need to know what we are doing. And indeed, one of the, one of the things that it, it, it is going to result in is genocide. Uh, this word genocide was not, we, Garvey didn't, it was not in uh, Garvey's vernacular at that time. The, the word genocide was, was, was coined by Lemkin uh, after the, the, the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust. And this word was coined in order to uh, try the Nazis on, on, on crime. So the, the word genocide was invented. And again, to, Garvey was way ahead of his time. Be, because again, he may not have had the word, but he saw, what, he saw the pattern of what was happening to black people in the world. Right? And if you read, you, you know, as I've reread the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey, you see him talking about it. I mean, when I was reading Garvey, in, you know, in my twenties, thirties, you know, I, the, 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 the extermination, the, the, the eradication of black people, in, I'm like, the four hundred. You know, what is he talking about? You know, uh, but His Majesty said it. Right? There, there is a war. And until the philosophy that holds one race superior and another, there is war. There is going to be war. The war is here. Right? In fact, uh, Paul Robeson led a charge to the United Nations and said, we, ch we charge genocide. Right? Uh, because of what was happening in America at the time. Between 19, no, between 1876 and 1925, black men and, and, well, black people, black men primarily, were lynched every other day, average, on average, right? I was telling my friend Paul, uh, I didn't want to go off topic, but uh, I had a slide in here that showed all of the communities that were destroyed, but when, when I, when I was told I only had 45 minutes, I, 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 had, a, I had a choice, and I, so I had to narrow it down. So I didn't want to get off topic, right? But all of the, 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 the communities that were destroyed throughout America because of the race wars that were happening, even in, our, even in Florida, Rosewood, and right now, right now in Florida, the Rosewood community, right, is being... And thanks to the work of Marvin Dunn, who is a scholar of black history in, in Miami, he actually bought a whole section of Rosewood as, in fact, uh, conducting history lessons. Because, again, the history of black people in, in Florida is being wiped out. They have a new textbook. They have a new textbook. Rosa Parks was asked, to move from her seat, and she moved from her seat. No mention of why. No mention of why Rosa Parks sat in that seat and would not move. So it's like Rosa Parks was just being, you know, a mad woman. She was asked to leave, and she didn't leave. No. But the whole history of race in Florida is being wiped out. And any person, white person, right, can object to a book that would make the children feel uncomfortable. In, in libraries all across Florida, books are being sent up for review. And if, and, and if one white parent doesn't like what is happening, that book will be removed from the library. You talk about erasure of history. This is like in the days of apartheid, when they 
a black person would win something and a white person would stand up beside him and they white out the black person. Right? The erasure is happening even as we speak. So how is climate change going to affect the Caribbean? Well, it's going to, going to uh, uh, affect, uh, uh, we're going to be having, um, well, let me get into it. So these are the ways that you know, climate change is going to be affecting the Caribbean. But I know you want to find out about Jamaica, right? How is it going to, how is it going to affect us here? And um, it, it, it is already happening in Jamaica. Uh, we're losing, we're losing coastlines, right? In Helsha is no, Helsha is no longer the Helsha of my youth, right? The whole coastline is is going, and it you know slowly. Uh, w the climate scientists predict that. We, we won't necessarily have more hurricanes. They will be just more intense. So instead of, you know, the, th the, 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 the 3.5 or the 5, you know, you're going to have 7, right? Uh, so expect more intense hurricanes coming. Uh, we're going to have flooding. And this is from the Gleaner, right? This is from the Gleaner. This is flooding happening, right? So expect more flooding. Heat waves. Again, this is not Babylon. This is our own University of the West Indies. Predictions of what is going to be happening. So the fact that we're, you know, the, the, what we're against here, and we are really now doing this for our grandchildren. Our precious grandchildren. Right? These, these, are, these are the projections. And again, it's, it's math. It's mathematics. Right? If this is this is this, n equals blah, you know. <laughs> then you just put it in the computer and you go, if this keeps on happening this way, then here's the end result. So these are some of the heat wave projections that we can expect in Jamaica. Now you can say, you know, how bad is it going to get? Well, luckily we have dreamers among us, and Diana McCauley is one of our dreamers. If you haven't read the book, uh, Daylight Come, read it. Right? You go outside in the sun and you're dead. Right? You have to be hiding. And again, it's the heat, we and them, because Jamaica is divided into those who live down here and those who live up there. And those who live up there have everything. Right? And the people who live down here have nothing. And so everybody trying to get. It's like how everybody going to try to get to Mandel before the heat waves, <laughs> before the heat waves hit us. Right? So Garvey says, preparedness. It, you know, and, and, and it's from, you know, you, you read Garvey with what is happening, and I am just amazed at his prescience, you know. But the man, the man was a genius. The man was a genius. But n nobody could acknowledge that black genius, right? I mean, look at how, look at how Garvey, long before anybody saw it, was saying, you know what? Let's go to Liberia and start tapping the um, rubber trees, right? And then Firestone moved in and just take him out of the whole thing, right? But Garvey put one and one and two and five and ten together, right? And, made, and, and was trying to make inroads into Africa, not only for our African homeland, but also to make sure that there would be an economic base for the nation that he was trying to, 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 to build in, in Africa. So, oops, sorry. So if we're talking about climate change being brought about 
by the ways that we are thinking. Who else, who else in the world is going to liberate us from our ways of thinking other than Marcus Garvey, right? He said we are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery, right? And this mental slavery shows up in so many ways. At the start of it, I mentioned about uh, the kidnapping and the losing of traditional ways of thinking. Again, Rastafari was trying to bring that back into the culture. You know, how do we think about ourselves? How do we think about our culture? I was talking with my friend Paul last night when I was preparing for this. Um, do we have any sacred rivers in Jamaica? Places that we hold as sacred. We know all indigenous, we know all indigenous religions, right? Have sacred places. The Blue Mount, you know, the Blue Mountain would be a sacred place. The Rio Cobra, Rio Grande, would be a sacred place. But do we, as Jamaicans, view that as sacred? Yeah. Something to think about. Garveyism and climate change. So we're bringing, it, we're bringing it all together now. How does Garveyism come into this climate change and climate justice? Uh, I, 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 one of the earlier incarnations of this was uh, rethinking Garveyism. And, uh, and I dread said to me, you can't rethink Garvey. <laughs> oh yeah, deal with Jeff. Rethink Garvey. You're mad. <laughs> but Gar Garvey, as, as um, Amy, Amy Jakes Garvey said, he planned for it. He was, remember, he's building an empire, which means that he is intending for Garveyism to go on long before he, long after he has passed. So it wasn't just going to be a 10 year thing. This was something that was going to be, that was going to propel us into the future. And indeed, uh, Amos talked about this, right? He talked about, you know, we, because we have so much work to do with the education, we get so tied up as, as, as students of Garvey or Gar Garveyites. We get so tied up talking about Mansa Musa. We get so tied up by talking about the kingdoms of Shanghai and Zimbabwe. But we never think about the future, right? But Garvey was all about the future. So, if I were to if I were to put together my dream team, you know, I'm a storyteller, right? I'm a storyteller, and I connect dots, right? So we're gonna keep the same respect Garvey paradigm, but how do we how do we talk about? Uh, Garveyism now. And this is just this is just my dreaming and speculation. So this would be my dream team, right? We'd bring in people like Vereen Shepherd, who is talking about reparations that is due to Africans, right? Education would be at the forefront. And my dream team leader would be Diana McCauley, right? who has been a leader in educating us about climate change. Self-reliance. Professor Dale Weber. Right? The self-reliance thing is very, very, very important. You know? But before you can talk about self-reliance, you have to know who you are, right? Many of our young entertainers, you know, are, are caught up into all kinds of things. And really and truly, if you don't know yourself, you're lost. And if you don't know yourself, in fact, Garvey has a, uh, has a whole chapter on know thyself. 
So many of these young entertainers who don't know themselves. All, if you don't know yourself, all you can talk about is what you have, you know. And every day they come on and video and show you what they have. But ask them one day, who are you? I'm waiting for the answer. Of course, we want to talk about purpose. We still have you among us, sir. So, we want you to, 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 because without, listen, Jamaicans, if we have a why we're doing things, we will go through anything. But just give us a why. Why we're doing this, boss? All right, we do, Gabby, make we do it. Right? And, 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 and the reason why also that we are talking about uh, respect God, it's in the vernacular. We meet each other and go, respect. Right? So if we're going to move forward with this thing, if once you say respect, you're moving it forward. Economic empowerment. Mikey Witter has been talking about Growing what we need to, you know, the food we eat. And remember, we talked about the grains dying, right? And the climate refugees. And the cassava breadfruit flour that Mikey Witter has been pushing now for almost 40 years. Right? Very, very important. And if we are going to feed the generation that is coming, we need to start planting the breadfruit suckers from now so they'll mature because breadfruit is already heat resistant right we need to be going heat resistant crops to feed our nation and thinking in pan-african terms what about our brothers in haiti what is going to happen are we going to i know this is going to happen the Americans are going to deploy fleets in the Caribbean Sea to turn them back. If we are Pan-Africanists, are we going to turn away our Haitian brothers and sisters? And how will that change us? We and them. We and them. Miss Terry Long, we have to bring in the youth. And she has been doing fantastic work, right? Bringing together all of us, children, old people like me. <laughs> and of course, tradition, right? Reviving the tradition. If you haven't seen any of them, please, please watch them. The Grow Nation series that uh, has been put together. Right? We need to be reasoning and talking about how we get out of this. Right? Herbie Miller has been doing a fantastic job. The last one I watched was, well, I watched, the last two that I watched was the one with Ibo Cooper and the one with uh, Wayne Chen and, um, and uh, Paul Burke. And they were talking about the 70s. It, 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 that program almost seemed like a truth and reconciliation uh, package that, that, he, that he has been doing. And of course, Michael was there and asking questions, <laughs> you know. But uh, it's necessary for us to start focusing in and bringing back the long bench, as it was called. But, but I like how he called it the ground nation because the ground nation puts us back with Walter Rodney and what Walter Rodney was trying to do. So, um, when, I, when I created this graphic, I was almost going to put Jamaica at the center. But being the proud Jamaican that I am, I really believe Jamaica can change the world, right? I really do believe that. I think if we, if we start getting serious about certain things, you know, because think about it. 
Bookman left Jamaica, went to Haiti, and the Haitian Revolution, which led to half of America being sold, right? To, to, uh, from, from the French to the English, right? Reggae music. My daughter, my daughter went, went, went to India with her aunt, and they were trying to get into Nepal to um, see the Dalai Lama. But they were, you know, turned away. But she goes around the corner, and who does she see plastered on a tree? Bob Marley, right? So if we start the, si the same reggae re revolution that, that happened in the 70s, I believe we can, the, the, the young people can come up with something that can really revolutionize, you know. But sometimes I feel like my generation, and the gener we're, we're the last of the whalers, you know. Um, whaling in the wilderness, you know. So most climate experts are not talking about, are not talking about stopping climate change. You know, uh, they're actually talking about uh, mitigation, right? Mitigation and adaptation. In fact, there's this uh, lawyer, I forget her name now, in New Orleans, Bab um, Babette Pinchon, if, if, I, if I remember her name correctly. She already knows that New Orleans is doomed but she's still leading the fight right, for climate justice. Right? So how do we start implementing, you know? Uh, I know we want flowers, I know we like, you know, it's, it, it's within the human character to love things of beauty. So we can, but we can start very escape, things like that, where you have vegetation, where you have beauty around you, but it, you know, the whole idea of the lawn that we worship is actually coming from the Scottish idea, right? Of the big lawn and everything else, of the landed gentry. So when, so when people came to America, right, and bringing that memory with them, and everybody wants to be a king now in America, you're going to have a lawn, right? But how do you adapt that now to the changing situation, right? You start developing ways of thinking. Yes, we want beauty around us. You know, that's, what cave, that's one of the reasons why we have cave art. Right? We want something beautiful. How do we create beauty out of an arid land? Right? Come on, Brad, we've been talking about this on creation. Right? How do we do this? I know we can do it. So, these are the, the, the three ideas that we can think about climate change, right? Um, it stems from colonialism, it is an ex existential threat, and the only way that we can probably save most of our people is through Adapt, and I, and I believe Garveyism is one of the ways in which we can bring the creative genius of our people to mitigate this. So how do we, how do, we uh, do it? Uh, as I said, I'm offering respect Garvey as, as ways of, of bringing about this change that we need to begin doing from yesterday, right? And it is indeed not even a generational crisis. It is, it is going to have to be intergenerational. In some ways, I think my generation uh, dropped the ball. Um, we did not institutionalize many of the insights. Uh, there are some people within my generation who have institutionalized the insights that we have brought. I will, make, I will make mention of people like David Scott, right? With Small Axe and with Essex Salon. I'll make mention of people like Kamau Brath, like Kwame Dawes, right? With Calabash, right?
but we've not institutionalized our insights. You know, it's still it's still out there. And you know, yes, yes, I know that. You know, we love to talk about Caribbean and our institutions as being rhizomatic. <laughs> you know, it's a nice idea, but really and truly, uh, we 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 need things like this, like this. Right, the inter the Edward Ball series that brings in people, so we keep on doing it. Things like this are very important, so we keep on top of the scholarship and the insights. You know, so if the, if you have anything to say about the lecture, you can go there and offer your feedback. It is it is welcome. And uh, I taught for so many years. These are the sources of uh, all of the things that, uh, I, uh, the ad libs that I've been doing. I'm, I, I, of course, not, not included. But um, these are all of the, the works that I've uh, talked about. Thank you so much. But before I end, Thank you so much for that riveting discussion, really trying to get us to think more about Garvey and, and climate justice. We're going to have a Q&A now. Um, and of course, you are all welcome to pose questions as well um, from the audience, right? So just you know, raise up that hand, and we'll get a microphone to you, I believe. Yeah, OK, yes, we will. So I'll start the conversation up here. But again, as questions arise, you are more than welcome to, to join in. Jeffrey, thanks very much for that presentation. I, I found it very compelling and very interesting. And of course, as with all things about climate change, a little scary. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, but, but I just wanted to ask because you know you you when we met, you were talking a little about you know your childhood and so on in Jamaica. And and I just wanted to ask. I mean, we look at you uh, and what I guess in Jamaica might be referred to as a brown man. Yes. And how did you become interested in, in Garvey and Garveyism? Mm. No matter where you come from, <laughs> as long as you're a black man, you're an African. <laughs> uh, to answer it another way, uh, I once told a friend of mine, I didn't have to go to America to realize that I was black. Right? I grew up on the music of the Whalers, of Peter Tosh. Right, those do, do, that was the music, that was the soundtrack of of my of my childhood. You know, my mother loved Bob Marley until him turned Rasta. Oh. Right, so I was listening to Bob all of this time. Right, she had no, she had some of the early simmer down and all, you know. So I was growing up, I was growing up with with, with, with the Whalers, and so so so, so and. I mentioned him a couple times, you know. You can't talk about Garvey without talking about Burning Spear. Mm -hmm. right? And Burning Spear was there. So these were the primary influences. Now, how, how I came to study 
It's a, it's an interesting story. It's a long story, but I, I, I will just put it this way. I was working for uh, uh, O.R. Daythorn. I was his teaching assistant at the University of Miami, and he wanted me to. He he didn't. I don't want to disrespect the man's memory. He threw me the keys to his car and he said, "Go teach his class for me," <laughs> right? And uh, I. He says, the class starts in three hours. And uh, it was on Garvey. And I, of course, I'd heard about Garvey, and da, 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 but you know, not. And so I had to prepare to <laughs> teach some graduate students about Garvey. And so I was like, mm. And in preparing for that lecture, that was the real, you know, that was the real impetus for me to get started. In, in, in reading and studying and, and going through. And of course, uh, when, when the, um, during Barack Obama's, that's when it, I mean, I really, t 10 years ago, I really started to get deeper and deeper into, into Garvey. Because before it was an academic exercise, you know, before it was an academic exercise, before it became like a, a real passion for me. Yes, Michael. Thank you. All right, that's on now. Thank you for the presentation, Jeffrey. Um, in Froling, um, you give me a lot to think about, but one of the things I have to say is that um, Garveyism, um, as you know, and some people don't know, but I've lived in the U.S. for 14 years, primarily South Florida, and you know I was part of the founding of the African New World Studies program at okay, FIU with uh, Professor Carol Boyce Davis yes. and stuff. So we had a very rich and dynamic um, Black Studies and African Studies um, program in South Florida at the time. I can't speak right now because I'm not there, but. The ethos of Garvey, what I realized living in the U.S., was very much, in fact, more intense and more alive in the U.S. than it was here in Jamaica, which, you know, was a paradox I've always tried to sort out in my mind. But I realized, uh, I put it down to neocolonialism and, in fact, um, you know, uh, various streams of, 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 of colonial lingering colonialism has kept Garveyism, yes. you know, down, away from the masses. Now, we've recently had a resurgence and a push for Garveyism in schools, and actually this February, Julius Garvey and, and uh, kind of led a delegation to bring back Garveyism in schools, and yes. it looks like it's happening. But in short, I am... Um, Bivalent about the connection. I mean, there is a philosophical connection, right. but in terms of the political connection between Garveyism and climate change, you're going to have to convince me on that one because right. Garveyism is that push for the liberation of African people, right. you know, from the oppression of uh, Euro but also the and colonial forces. But also, he was fighting against the extermination. And as I said, one of the driving forces in Garvey's life was justice. Uh, justice, justice for the people, yes. Human yes. rights and so forth. Right. As we had the Declaration of so, the Human Rights of the right. Negro in and 1920. And remember, yeah. Garvey is the first one to, along with the, the UNIA, yeah. to come up with the, the rights of the Negro peoples of That's the world. Right. That's so what right. I'm saying is, if th there is a logical connection between justice and climate justice, right? So if you're going to fight for justice, you can't just fight for justice on the human rights level. You have to, because Garvey has must to expand into planetary justice, right? And if you can make that step, and, and if you can put Garvey at, maybe, maybe I'm blinded because of my love for Garvey, right? But if you put Garvey at the center of climate justice and justice of Africa, at home and abroad, I think it will have a broader and more compelling 
appeal rather than you know, I'm not putting anything against all, you know, these climate activists that, that are out there. But m in general, I think black people are divorced from the whole idea of, 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 of climate change and climate justice. And if you put Garvey in the mix, I think we will become more involved and in fact are ask for uh, our part in climate justice, which is why again, with the reparations movement, Garvey is it putting Garvey there in the center of the, the, the argument. All right, the last thing I would say on that, I mean, you've given more clarification. I mean, when you say climate justice versus climate change, right. you know, the connection is more Well, natural. this is why, this is yeah, why. Yeah. Why you changed the. That, that's why I, I changed it. Because as I, was, as I was working through, you know, the, the, the lecture, and, and, and again, thank you, Rochelle, for making me not, I have a tendency to go off on tangents. Mm -hmm. So when she said, you know, so I had to just like, okay, what is, it, what is the core idea that you want to talk about? And the core idea is justice and climate justice, right? And so there was a, there was a, a, a refining of the idea from clim just, just a sort of broad general climate change to climate justice. So the last thing I would say is that you first of all though have to liberate and empower the people because when they're dealing with basics like where to get the next food, uh, plate of food to eat and so forth, they're probably not, you see, thinking about climate justice becomes a luxury. It's still seen as a upper middle class, upper class concern. But is, but it's is not, shouldn't be. It shouldn't but be. But I'm, I'm saying the reality is that a lot of people say, I am concerned about where I'm going to get my next plate of yeah, food. Yeah, I understand Let alone that. fight in the struggle but, for But here's the people. thing. Is I and I going to feel it, you know? Is I and I going to feel it? And, 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 and if we, and if we, and Garvey lives, walk along any street in Jamaica, drive along any street in Jamaica, Garvey is there on the walls. Garvey lives in Jamaica. So what I'm saying is, bring Garvey. It, it, in other words, for this to catch, in order for this to catch a fire, <laughs> right? You have to start Somewhere. with I and I. Don't, don't, <laughs> all right? And bring, bring, because I'm sure, I'm sure if we walked out to, today and walked into the street and I said, Gavi say justice, Gavi say climate justice. Right? And, and if we bring in the singers and the songwriters and the storytellers, I think we will see a change, right? But that's just, you know, again, I may be, I may be blinded. <laughs> By, by, by my love for Garvey's works. So, so that is just a, that's just a solution that I, I am. I'm not saying it's the only solution, but that for me seems to be the only logical solution. It's logical, and as you mentioned, I'm glad Rastafari, Rastafari. are advocates for the communion with, yes. with, with our natural environment. Yes. That is the ideological shift that yes. people really have to make fundamentally, the communion yes with nature and with our environment. Well, look, at, so you know, yeah. Rastafari has been, been saying for ages, you know, liberty and not vanity. You know, if, if, if the entertainers today had taken that into consideration, then we wouldn't, you know, half, half of the videos that they have out there wouldn't exist because it's pure vanity them talking about. I have nothing against vanity, <laughs> right? Everything, you know, you have, have it in balance though. And balance, you know. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I think I want to maybe circle back to some of the points that, that you started with and then maybe came up as well from uh, Michael's uh, point. And, you know, this idea of how to bring Garvey into climate justice is critical, yes. right? Um, but then this point, too, about where did it, where does, where do, Caribbean people fit within this, right? I think that's why Diana McCauley's book was so successful right. um, and so important is because it, it placed Jamaica squarely on that map yes. to consider, okay, well, what happens here? If, you know, we've been thinking about Greta Thunberg, um, well, what happens here in Jamaica when things go completely 
haywire, let's right. say, right? And so I think that that was a successful text, and that's why, you know, um, you know, the IDB, I think, was giving out the text at different points because they wanted different people, different members of the, the Inter-American Development Bank uh, member countries to, to read this and really feel it. But there's still this idea about where does the um, African diaspora citizen fit within this. And I think that Garvey might be the way. I, now, now, the one thing I guess I want to circle back to in terms of how music fits is the answer you gave to the question that um, Rachel Mosley Wood posed, and you started thinking about Burning Spear and how you, know, you came to Garvey so easily, so handily through the music that was sharing the messages. So do you suppose that the music needs to take up climate justice more in order to, to spread the word? Of course. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they're going to do it, you know, but, uh, you know, you, you give an idea to an artist mm -hmm. and, and, and they will surprise you every, and especially, you know, if, if we can write about, if Love and Dear can write a, a song about, about a hurricane, you know, we, we are, we are a very inventive people. Indeed. And I know if this idea sinks in, especially with Garvey, I think we can start to, I mean, and in little, you know, the little ways, and it will branch out and branch out. Mm -hmm. but, but, but give us a purpose. Mm. Give us a reason why we're doing this. Give us a reason why we're going to make these sacrifices, and we will do it. But it can't be just for, you know, the man up so, or the prime minister says so. We have... It, we have a question that came in through YouTube. This is from Kofi Campbell. Garvey promoted industrialism, but climate activists hate capitalism and industrialization. How do you reconcile that contradiction? I am not a genius in these things. You'd have to, uh, again, I'm a storyteller, mm. right? Mm. But I know there can be a balance. I, th there, there can be a balance that is achieved between creating and preserving mm -hmm. and right now because remember remember the philosophies of Descartes and all of these people rendered the earth inert is a dead thing we do not look upon the earth as a living organism as a living thing and once we you know once you start to see the earth Joseph Campbell said in one of his lectures he said we are the eyes of the earth. We are the voice of the earth. Right? If we started to look at the earth, again, which is what Rastafari has been saying, but in a different way. If we start to look at the earth, as, and, and as us, as the eyes of the earth, the ears of the earth, the voice of the earth, you're changing how we think about the earth. You're th so we're changing how you're thinking about industrialization and all of this. So, so it's not just going in and building a factory and we don't care what we put out. Right? We don't care how much carbon we put. Right? Because guess what? It cuts into our profit margin. But you can have a factory where you take into consideration the carbon output. Right? And then you say, how are you going, how are you going to, to measure the carbon output against what you're doing? Because currently what is happening in the States, a factory goes in and it does irreparable damage to, the, to, to, to a river, like in Flint, Michigan or all these places. But the company doesn't pay any money. Who comes in and rescues? The EPA. And they've taken all of the teeth out of the EPA, right? So how, how, how do we create this balance where if, if you know you are going to, to cause harm, right? how do you mitigate that harm? How do you lessen that harm and not have taxpayers pay for the damage that is going to be done or is being done? Right? How do you do that? There are ways that economists can come up with these ways in order to create that balance, but again, if you think you can do things with impunity, which is what they've been doing, right? Look, look at what is happening here in Jamaica. So if you think you can act with impunity, you will. Because if you're only protecting the profit margin, 
right, and not the people, then you will do anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are right now. I think I have time for one more question. Do I? Okay, so the last question, I suppose, because we are nearing the end, is, is to ask you if you can maybe speak a bit more specifically about that quote you offered by Garvey, preparedness is the watchword of this age. Can you give us, perhaps, um, some pointers, right? What is it, what has Garvey prepared us for, right? Preparedness Oof. is the watchword of this age. What can we walk away from this and say that with Garvey's words, we can now do this in the face of climate emergency, which is really where we are right now? First, I think we have to start educating ourselves about climate change. Um, so that, that, that is key, educating ourselves about what is this thing that is here. You know, fire the most, most stale, most, most thing is called cool breeze, cool breeze, right? Educating ourselves, making sure, as I said, it, it's our grandchildren we're talking about and great-grandchildren who are going to feel this, right? So we need, we, we, we need to educate ourselves. We need to start preparing ourselves, right, for the changes that will be coming. How can we reduce our carbon footprint? How can we, how can, you know, just go through the whole thing of, of, of respect. Supporting, supporting the reparations movement. Educating ourselves. Talk about self-reliance. How can we be more self-reliance? Right? What is the purpose of what we are doing? Right? The economics, again, going back with what Mikey Witter was talking about. Right? Decolonizing our palates. In my time, I remember the big fight was over American apples. Mm. Can you believe that? Right? American apples. Right? Growing what we eat. You know, Walker talks about the mango or the oak. Right? L again, there has been a war against the native. Anything native was deemed, you know. We, we, we have superstitions, but they have religions. Right? So all of these ways, the, 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 the community, how do we bring in the community? Like I said, Ms. Terry Long has been doing a great job. Traditions, how, you know, Herbie Miller, if you're listening, how do we expand the grow nation, right? And I say, you can't forget Rodney, right? And bring in, you know, we have a whole tradition. We have a whole tradition of revolutionary thinkers here in Jamaica. The first one, as I said, being Bookman, right? You could put Bookman, Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, you know, Walter Rodney, Kamau Brathwaite. We have revolutionary thinkers. All that, you know, all we have to do is put it into practice, right? But there are forces against our putting this into practice, right? In some ways, Jamaica is a very conservative culture, right? We are afraid of so many things, you know. Uh, we talked there you know, in one of the sides I talked about uh, Garvey didn't have a word for it. But it, uh, Martin Seligman came up with a term called learned helplessness. Right? A learned helplessness is, is where you resign yourself. And this happens over generations. And even done sometimes out of love. You resign yourself to seeing yourself in a powerless situation. Garvey was against that. Garvey said, you know, you, you have action and you have to act on what you believe. And so, so all of these, I mean, if we, if, we go, if we go back and read the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey with the idea of we need, we as a people need to combat this, this, this change that is here, mitigate this change that is here, change our mind, change our minds about the things that are around us. I think we'll be able to get through it. Mm. The larger forces are out there, but 
you know, I can't really think about England and I have to think about my people. <laughs> and I don't, I, 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 it, it, it is going to be dread. It is dread. And I hope we can get through this. Mm. Well, let those be the, wait, do we have one more question? Can we take one more question? Okay, one question. Yes, good evening. I have found your lecture very interesting, but I cannot resist uh, asking, how do you see what you have discussed uh, within the context of the faculty, the Department of Literatures in English, and the Edward Bauer Lecture? Because I do believe that I, well, I thought I would have heard you address that point All right. at the uh, end of the lecture, because it cannot be that you are powerless or the Department of Literatures in English is powerless. Right. So um, could you suggest how you could use your talents or the department could use its talents to advance this conversation? Thank you so much for that question. <laughs> I have a new book called Archipelagos, <laughs> buy it. <laughs> Archipelagos, the whole thesis of Archipelagos. It starts with Columbus mm -hmm. and it ends with Columbus. The, 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 it, <laughs> a poem called The Admiral which yeah. ISIS here helped <laughs> to edit and give me some very good ideas. So it starts with Columbus uh, looking out from the deck of his ship mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and going in. And it goes through uh, all of the, the, the variations of how I hope. You see, I don't want to preach in the poems. Preaching is one thing, but a poem is another thing. A poem is a thing of beauty. So I've tried to combine the beauty with the stark realities, right? So, so, so yes, buy my book, <laughs> Archipelagos, uh, which, 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 which ties together Garveyism, which, t in fact, the last line of Archipelagos in the poem called The Admiral ends with, uh, well. Don't give it away. Yes. Oh, could you read one of the I did. I got, all right. Diana, I forgot to hear oh, this no, thing. I'll give you mine. Oh, all right. Yeah, you don't have to mess with me. But you can't read what I tell you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this is the book. <laughs> this is the book. Uh, let me get on. So I'm glad you asked that question, right? Um, I think absolutely. It's, it's the literature, it's the poetry, it's the art that really implants itself in the mind. And that's what really winds up being that motivating factor, right? So when, when Jeffrey was referencing Burning Spear, it's because those songs lodged their way in. When Sylvia Cohenberg was mentioning Eddie Baugh's work, Professor Baugh's work, it's because those poems are the ones that captivated her, right? So thank you for asking. You know, I don't, I don't know yeah. if we have copies on there. In fact, in fact, someone who was not mentioned here, but who I was thinking about in, uh, you know, in, in a moment of silence, was Tony McNeil. And, and Tony McNeil talking about, you know, this morning uh, with Columbus and the grass is ours, right? Merely because it is ours. I mean, you look, in fact, uh, Kamau Brathwaite is one, is, is, uh, Kamau Brathwaite gave a lecture called The Middle Passages. And you go through the middle passages and you talk, you know, this was very central. I can, there, there are several poets who are, who are central to my understanding of this. And, you know, the, the poem, in fact, Archipelagos, takes a line, the, the opening line is from Derek Walcott. At the end of the sentence, rain will begin. You know, so it's a, it's a combining of, of, of poetry, right? But also, uh, but also uh, the, the stark realities of, of, of class. I don't know if I should read Archipelagos. Should, let me read, let, let me, so the last line of this, 
Very good question. Thank you. I get to sell some more coffee. <laughs> so the last line of uh, the poem called The Admiral. Uh, or maybe I should read it. All right, maybe. And I'll go back to Archipelagos. How does that sound? It doesn't take too long. All right. The Admiral. Freed by an Obia woman who wanted a little company every Friday evening, the Admiral, when everyone else was asleep, would crawl down his pedestal to answer the summons to her bed, where he'd stay until midnight and then dis ascend to his rightful position, the title he once bore, Viceroy of the Indies. But it had been three years since his liberator died, yet her curse remains. Now the admiral heads straight to the cemetery to pay respects to his mistress, climbs to her shack at the top of Liberty Hill to claim part of her inheritance she'd hidden under her floor and where he keeps sun-bleached clothes he'd stolen from the poor on Windsor Road like a common thief so he could roam anonymous among these New World Africans, and the rumhead nicknamed him the Cuban because of his accent. The admiral hated that name. He preferred the name his mother, Susanna, had given him. Christopher Corumbo whispered in the soft syllables of her Ligurian tongue. But at least it was better than one, one dreadlocked African whom the Admiral would have sworn had figured out his identity, called him Christopher Combocos. Grabbing his clothes, the Admiral walked past women selling, selling cheap goods from Cathay, as if the Silk Road had reached Jamaica, to his favorite bar near the Negro River, which reminded him of the tavern that Domenico, his father, had owned in Savona where he had learned the secrets of the ocean winds and stories about fabled Sipangu. But everywhere had been discovered, and when the admiral entered the bar, he offered his usual shot of rum from Rosie, a beautiful African woman, whom he had loved to draw, but was afraid she'd be offended. The last thing the admiral needed was angry Africans poking into his business. Gripping the shot glass between his thumb and index finger with the same firmness as he has had the pen, pens, when he signed letters demanding justice from the Spanish court, pleadings that were never resolved, the admiral watched the news on the television, a miracle if he ever saw one, about the toppling of Edward Colson's statue. And although their nations had always been at war, they were allies in the same cause. So the admiral retreated to the back of the bar, where he settled among the shadows and sipped his drink until a group of Africans, led by the dreadlocked one, sat in front of the television, blocking his view. Though furious at the effrontery, the admiral held his anger and shifted in his chair. His mistress had tutored him in the ways of the island but he had never grown accustomed to the speech of these Africans. He moved his chair close to, the, to eavesdrop on the conversation that had captured his attention. Tear him ras off the rock, the dreadlock African, who had escaped the enchantment of the empire by studying his reflection. And the images burned on the screen. As the images burned on the screen, the admiral gulped down the rest of his drink and signaled to Rosie for another shot. When he saw the beheading of his statue in Boston, the drowning of another in Richmond, and realized that if the African's plan, the African's plan would mean his second death. Grind the marble to dust and dash it in at the sea, one of the Africans added. The African wanted to object. The Admiral wanted to object. But I was a messenger of Christ, and the word of God has now spread to the four corners of the world. A sign of the second coming is at hand. 
but he remembered what had happened in Española to the nine-year-old girls he had procured for his Castellanos, but knew if he still possessed the power he once wielded, he would have cut out their tongues as his brother Bartolomeo had done to a woman who had claimed that their family had descended from common stock, or sliced off their ears as his men had done to the Indios to test the sharpness of their blades. But when the Africans raised their glasses to a toast, to Christopher Combocus, to Christopher Combilos, dead man walking, the Admiral felt a tremor had shaken the foundations of the island. The Admiral wanted to run away, but where? He was duty bound to answer the call of answering the town. So he wanted, he waited until the last African to leave before he paid his debt for the night with Rosie, who asked, same time next week, Cuban? The Admiral grumbled goodbye. And as he staggered up Main Street, he wondered when he'd hear the sound of Africans marching along the roaring river, sunlight glinting off their machetes, the tools of their ancestors chanting the words of their liberator, we must emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. Thank you. So I think we'll stop there, right? So there you have it, um, a call to not only purchase the text, but a call to action, right? Um, the ways that Garvey resides in the words of Jeffrey Philp, um, all of the words. Um, if you heard the introduction that I gave, in all of his works, all of his published works, Garvey rests in there somewhere. Right? And so it's for us to do that work, I suppose, that Garvey work, the work that Garvey has encouraged us to do, which is to educate ourselves, to read and read and read more. Read about climate change, climate emergency, and to read anything that we are unaware of and expand our knowledge so that we can give something to our, our future. Right? Each one, teach one. So thank you so much for staying with us, for coming out on the internet and in person. And thank you so much, Jeffrey Philp, for this stimulating lecture that has all of us thinking and considering these connections. And may we all just live well. Thank you so much. Thank you. to thank ISIS, thank um, Dr. Samaj Hall for so ably chairing the Q&A and giving the introduction, yeah. to thank all the members of the Department of Literatures in English, our senior admin assistant, uh, Mrs. Venice Gordon Francis, uh, Ms. Whitney Eaton, and Mr. Elton Johnson. Johnson, thank you. Elton is one of our graduate students. Uh, thank you so much for that question as well. Um, you know, it really started me thinking too. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one, one of your questions was, are we powerless? And I think of myself as an educator uh, in a recent class that I had, trying to make the research we were doing more relevant to my students. I went around, it's a small class as we often have in, in English these days, but I went around asking them what are their interests, what are their passions and what drives them. Nobody said, to my surprise I must admit, climate change. No, nobody identified that. Um, listening to, to Jeffrey, one of the things that I'm encouraged to do now is to try to incorporate that in my classes, to try to think about how um, the films that we study, the texts that we study, how can we bring in those concerns and those issues. I think Jeffrey started by saying, uh, by talking about the power of thought and the power of change in your thinking. So that's where I think our power lies as a department, as lecturers, uh, and as people talking, reading, and communicating those ideas and working towards change. I would say even if it is only at the level of thought, but that is the first and most important step. 
to change our way of thinking. So thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Drive home safe.